had a a plan to give you some um, Fermi estimates on this plot, like Fermi trying to get uh, an idea of the energy released in the bomb by just looking at the picture. Uh, so I was going to do some uh, dimensional analysis and then do some more calculations. But I think it would be uh, educational and uh, to do some actually uh, more specific calculations. So we're going to do the reservations of some formula that you may have seen or you may have not. So it would be nice to see some uh, calculation. And after we set up these calculations, that will give us the uh, typical binding energy of a binary system and the radiated power, like through the quadruple formula, uh, we will be able to estimate by looking at this picture what are the parameters of the source, OK? Which is one of the, of the key goals of gravitational wave astronomy to identify what is the source that produced the gravitational waves that were observed by LIGO. So that was the detection, OK? So what I'm going to do now is do some calculations. Uh, also because when I asked whether some of you had seen this equation, how the, the, the geodesic deviation and the change in, in, uh, in length based on the propagation of gravitational wave in TT gauge, I got the impression that some of you may have not seen some of these calculations. So I decided to do some basic computations, and then we'll see if we can speed up uh, based on how much you have seen before. OK, so the idea is to solve Einstein equations. We're going to do the leading order calculations, which is in the weak field limit. So we have some source, there's some distribution. In this case, a leading order is going to be some mass that we're going to basically keep the mass distribution, but we have uh, some T mu, some stress and tensor. tensor. We we're going to have uh, uh, gravitational waves emitted by the time variation of this source. And we're going to have, uh, write the equation that will give us what is the at least a leading order, which we'll see in which, or in which expansion parameters we're going to be computing the emission of gravitational waves in this TT gauge that eventually is going to be what enters in the, in the LIGO detector, or what is going to produce the, the pattern that we observe in the LIGO detector. OK? So I'm going to be uh, setting these coordinates. I'm in the center of mass. Eventually, this is going to be the binary, but let's make this uh, generic, so some distribution of mass. We're going to sit in the center of mass. We're going to look far away and some distance d. And this variable x prime essentially moves around uh, inside the distribution. And when we have two binaries, we're going to have x1, x1 and x2 only. And we'll see how we're going to treat the fact that the black holes are going to have size. But to first approximation, we'll see that this is, will be a delta function of m1 and m2, uh, to live in order, OK? So that's just again ahead of myself. I just basically tell you that keep in mind that we're going to be studying the binary problem. But this is very generic. So we're going to solve Einstein's equations with some stress energy tensor and in linearized uh, gravity. So the approximation will be that we're far away, and the wavelength of the gravitational waves and millions are much longer than the size of the object. And this will, is going to be true for the most part when we can calculate, which is in the regime, for example, in the binary problem in which the velocities. Uh, sometimes I'm going to be using uh, Cs and G newtons. Sometimes I'm not. Um, when, when, when it's useful, they will appear. Um, so V over C. It's going to be less than 1. And then sometimes I'm going to just call it v. So the wavelength is much longer than the separation. Okay? And this is going to allow us to do a multiple expansion. That, that is what is going to come out here, the quadruple moment, the octuple moment, so on and so forth. Okay? So this is what we're going to walk into. Okay? So <clears throat> we're going to solve Einstein's equations. And here, often, this bar means that we're using the Lorentz gauge. And we use this object that it was not an issue when you are uh, <clears throat> in the TT gauge because the trace, we, we chose it to vanish because we were solving the vacuum equations that allow us to give us some more gauge freedom. Uh, but in general, you may have seen that there is this guy. that is used in this gauge to simplify your life and write this equation out of Einstein, right? And we do in linearized gravity, so we're using a round flat space. Very good, and as you might know, by using the green function associated um, with the box, Uh, 
delta T minus the T retarded, and the T retarded, X minus X prime, or C. Then from here, Uh, we would we get the solution for H, uh, which is equal to four G Newton. You'll see uh, why I'm gonna. I try an effort because often when you see the derivations, you don't see all the factors of G Newton and C. I, I've been trying to keep track of those because eventually we're gonna compare with data. I know that this is kind of weird if we're doing a string theory course, but we'll try to do that, which means we'll try to get some numbers which are what they appeared here in terms of amplitudes, typical amplitudes, typical frequencies, and, and uh, uh, times, okay? And that's why it was gonna be useful to see in gravity, where are the typical time scales that show up? And remember, we're not doing quantum gravity, so Planck is not gonna show up anywhere, so we're not gonna use in tam uh, Planck times, Planck masses, although when we do calculations in the field theory approach, we will use uh, uh, this idea of, of Feynman diagrams and the h-bars, I going to pop up, but that will cancel in the final calculation. So you will see M Planck's probably at the end of these lectures, but that doesn't mean we're doing anything quantum. In fact, we can do quantum corrections and, and show that they're small because the charges in this case, like the masses, are huge. So essentially, all the three-level exchange dominates over the loop corrections. Okay? So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of these guys. Hopefully, I didn't forget anybody. All right, so this is... What you expect, this is the time, this is the space, and we're integrating over the source. This is nothing different than what you do in electrodynamics. You have an A and you have a J, so you all have seen one way or another uh, this, okay? So now we're gonna do an approximation. We're gonna say that this is very, very far away. So up to corrections that we'll try to quantify, and I'll show you how we're gonna quantify. Essentially, we're gonna separate we're gonna uh, uh, approximate the x prime minus x that appears there by the distance, one over d. Also, we're gonna say that the time variations are slow, which is associated with the slow motion. So we can also replace it here in the time. And we're gonna get an equation then from here that's gonna resemble more of what you expect in some approximation that we'll try to set up. Uh, so you get a one over distance, which is what you expect, and then you get an integral of this. So up to, so up to this part, this is just a one over d radiation field out of a source. Right, a little in order. I mean, in principle, you, you can expand this x minus x prime and get the higher corrections and so on, right? Very good, so how do we massage this expression to get what you expect, which is all these multiple moments? So what we do is we use the conservation of T mu nu, and this is gonna be key because we're talking about gravity, and now I'm doing the approximation in which I'm doing linearized gravity, so there is a covariant conservation of the T minu associated with matter, but a linear order, I'm not gonna care about those corrections. There is a pseudo tensor that is gonna include the self gravitation here, all the, the forces that are gonna bind the system, those are gonna gravitate as well. So there's gonna be a new T minu, and I'll show you where it's gonna come from. But right now we're just doing linearized gravity uh, with some uh, stress energy tensor, this is just the matter part, which is conserved. And from here, we get something that relates time variations to spatial variations. So the time derivative of this guy and this you can get just from the uh, uh, doing it once and with the zero i and related the zero i to the zero zero, doing it again, and then you get something like this. Um, okay, so these two are already uh, giving us uh, a hint of how to massage this expression. We're gonna particularize this for the ij because ultimately we want to go to the tt gauge. 
And in the TT gauge, remember, it's traceless, so this bar is not going to play much of a role. Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, OK, we have this guy, but we're going to do the following trick. We're going to multiply by xi, xj, and we're going to integrate. Uh, now, uh, one of the first lessons I learned in, in high school, this is not x and x prime, don't get confused, right? This is just a dummy integral variable. I'm going to show you how to relate this integral to moments of this guy, okay? Even though I call it x here, x prime, right? Uh, very good. So what you do here is you integrate by parts, assuming that uh, you, you make this integral in, at infinity, and the source obviously is localized, so all the contributions from infinity are not going to show up. So this integral in principle is everywhere, right? Now this is non-trivial when you include the gravitational field of the source into the T mu, which we will. These are key elements of the computation, or there will be key elements of the computation. So there are things called tails which is the, the, the gravitational wave emission will talk to the gravitational potential of the whole system far away, okay? Not only here, locally, also far away. Those tails are gonna make this argument a little tricky, um, so I'm not gonna talk about it, okay? Uh, from the point of view of how we do things, this is, this is not an issue, but uh, um, it requires a little subtlety. But uh, here, I'm just using the T minu of the source, so everybody's happy it's localized. Or even when we include the short modes of the gravitational potentials, that's also localized, and we don't have an issue with that. So if you integrate by parts, then you see you hit twice this guy. So you get something which is symmetrized, L, I, J, and then the symmetry. Then you get the, the other guy, and you get twice the same. So you get T, I, J plus T, J, I. And this is symmetric. And when we include the self energy, we will make a symmetric two. So this gives you a two. So if I put a half here, x i x j, I had an eraser, right? Then we just show, and these are called moment relations, and this is an integral in x, so I can pull this guy out. And this depends on t and x, and I'm taking the derivative with respect to this guy, and I put a half, then this is t i j d 3 x. Um, it's an art to do this to higher orders, and you will see what I mean by higher orders. When you have higher order moments, of different components of the T, of the T minu, okay? You will use these moment relations often, using conservation laws, to relate and get the radiative part of the, of the field, okay? Because using this moment relation, from here, this integral is exactly the integral of T uh, uh, ij. The only difference is the time here is gonna be evaluated in the retarded time. And therefore, let's write over here, the Hij, let's keep the bar, is 4G Newton over C to the 4D. And then let, you have a half, and you have D by DT squared of uh, uh, the integral of T0, 0, 0, Xi, Xj, D3X. And this object here, and this is evaluated, sorry, minus t over c, x, x, i, x, j. And this object here, I, I put a half in the two here, right? It's um, q, i, j, evaluated in t, d over c. So this whole thing here is two derivatives. Because now that we did the integral in x, the only thing that has interest here is in t, 
but this is the, the variable you need to evaluate it. So you take two derivatives with respect to whatever this depends upon, which is t, and then you evaluate it here, okay? And therefore, hij is equal to g newton over c to the four d. And this is the quadrupole formula. So this guy is this guy, and this guy is this guy. And in the approximation uh, that we're using, that we're neglecting the self-energy, this is just the density. And uh, we're gonna project this, so we are almost done, we have to project this to the TT gauge. So we're gonna define the symmetric trace free part of the leading order quadrupole, which is where it's gonna enter here. We're gonna use the mass density. All this is what we're gonna use later on for this plot. So a leading order, this is gonna be just the mass. And remember, we're gonna go to the TT gauge in which is symmetric trace free. So we're taking the trace out. So this is the usual thing, by the way, that gravitates. If you want to compute the Newtonian potential produced by this thing, you will get the one over RQ times this guy, right, X I, X J. The same, the same, if instead of solving the wave equation, you will solve in the Poisson equation, you will get something very similar, right? Very good, so what we'll notice something that uh, we will use later on Something that we, all the time dependence comes from here, this integrates over all space, but what's gonna happen is that because the source is localized, when we look at the binary, the density is gonna put us on top of the masses, right? So that was, it's gonna give us the, the formula is gonna be a sum over the masses as you would expect, okay? Notice something very interesting here is that I'm telling you about separation of scales. So this is a multiple moment associated with a source, it's a moment of a source, right? I integrate over the, all the space, not a space and time, space, and compute a moment in which I map this whole thing into a point with a quadruple, right? So what we did here, we map this interacting with a long wavelength radiation into a point like a source. In this case, the source is the quadruple interacting with the radiation. But this is time dependent. So we sort of, the, in the jargon of uh, field theory, we sort of integrate out the space bar, the short modes in space, but the time variation and the scale of the time variation was happening here, and the time variation of lambda is about the same. And therefore our Wilson coefficients, as we will see, terms like this that are gonna address our point particle action <clears throat> are time dependent. Which is not usual what happens. The Wilson coefficients usually are just numbers. When you integrate out some, high, because you're in Lorentz, <coughs> Lorentz invariant theory. And therefore space and time are the same. Now we don't have Lorentz invariance. We're breaking uh, in the post-Newtonian expansion. It will be recovered order by order, but okay, that's a different story. Uh, so there is a split between space and time. And therefore, our coefficients are gonna be uh, time dependent. Okay, so to compute the H, to finally compute the H, we need to project into the TT gauge. Which is what enters in the equation that give us the displacement. Remember, we got the variations. What that, what's that, symmetric trace free. Oh, sorry, I, I said it with words, but I didn't write it down. So it is symmetric, or you can symmetrize it if it, it isn't. Uh, why we insist on symmetric, in this case, it's obvious, but then uh, a higher order, so it will depend on the t mu, and the t mu will include the corrections from the self-gravitational part, and so you have to have a symmetric uh, tensor. And trace free, this is symmetric trace free. Thank you. And this is what this is doing for you. And why is because we're gonna go to the uh, TT gauge. So uh, 
So there was a T first for transfers. There is a T for trace, which removes the bar, because now H trace free is the same as trace, because we're removing the trace, which is zero. And here it is symmetric, but let's just put symmetric trace free. So we're almost done. We need one more T. Um, this is, as I was saying, this is the, the um, actually I can show you again. This is this guy that will give us these equations down there that will tell us in the TT gauge, for example, the plus polarization, how is it going to change distances, which is what we observe here in terms of the perturbation, right? Um, okay. So we need to do the TT projection. So we need to go now to the transverse, and we're looking far away. So we have some here, some sphere far away at some distance t, and there's some norm n, h i over d. So we do a projection into the TT gauge in general with this guy. I, K, J, L, minus, and then we take the trace, but I already did, but okay. Where P, I, J projects away from the direction, the end direction. And then the I, J transfers traceless, uh, U, K, L, double dot, let put, let's put the 2 G Newton or C to 4 D, and it's evaluated in T minus D over C. So this is our leading order expression for, a sor for the uh, uh, gravitational waves emitted of a source that is changing its quadrupole moment in time. And it depends on the second derivative of the quadrupole moment. OK? Now there is something that you can ask. Why uh, this you learn in many different flavors across your education? Uh, why you have dipole radiation in EMM? Why do you have uh, quadrupole radiation here? And if you look at the moments that you can write down, just naively, right? So we'd say, why, what about lower moments? Well, if you write the moments of rho, you get the energy or the mass, which is conserved, so it wouldn't radiate. If you write the, the moment of x, then you get essentially the center of mass, or, because it's m, x, and all sum over everything, right? Uh, so you, you get derivatives of that, you get the momentum, the momentum is conserved, so that doesn't radiate either. So then you get the second moment. You can get moments of the velocities, x and v's, with some cross products. So that will give you currents. Currents will give you angular momentum, but the total angular momentum is also conserved. So the current also will not radiate. Uh, so, but you can have a, a, a uh, OK, we'll see. There are, current, uh, there are, there are also couples to uh, magnetic, like the same way that you can have uh, uh, in, in uh, ENM. So we'll see a little bit of that. But it is clear then that the second moment is the one that can have some uh, time dependence, just some conservation laws. Right? That's what people often say. It's actually a little trickier. But uh, ask me later to go back to that. Uh, why, how is really the conservation law working here? Um, because we see that the, the energy of the system is being lost in gravitational waves. Right? So there is an M dot for the system. The energy of the system is not conserved. You're losing energy. Okay? So it's a, it's a little tricky. Uh, but okay. But here, uh, uh, the approximation that we're doing things, this is M, and M dot, for example, is definitely zero. At least, unless you include absorption where the black holes start growing, which is an effect that you can include, and include the conservation of energy in that case, it will give you some constraint. Okay? So it, it, gravity is much more subtle than, uh, well, GR people obviously do know this. OK, so now what happens is with this, um, with this metric, we can compute the total radiated power. 
And um, this is done in the standard way by computing like the pointing vector with the stress energy tensor associated with the metric field, which is just take Einstein's equations and construct the pseudo stress energy tensor, which is conserved, that is added to the T mu nu of matter to have a normal like uh, water identity. Um, we will rederive this in a, in a more modern way. Uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of the lectures, you will see uh, how we do these uh, derivations. But I'm going to do it in the standard manner, just uh, um, to illustrate how it's usually done. Um, one comment here that I want to emphasize is that what happens when you start including these uh, uh, self-gravitation uh, uh, interactions how would this change? Because here, for example, I define it with the mass. So how would you go on and to uh, include those corrections? Well, how do we get this equation, right? It's this linearized gravity. You have a bulk term, and you have a term that is t mu nu h mu nu, right? Well, we can just look at that term. We can look at the term that is t mu nu h mu nu. And we look in this separation with scales in which we keep the h associated with radiation as our long wavelength field. This is the guy that varies on a scale of order lambda. And then we can treat whatever happens here, whatever happens here, that we're going to call actually potentials. We're going to take those potentials that are varying on scales which are shorter than the scale of the wavelength in space, not in time. In time, they're going to scale with the same time scale because everything in time changes with V. But in space, they're going to be separated, and this is going to scale like 1 over. Uh, that's a mu nu. What am I doing this? I'm doing this for this audience. And now, because you know this, um, we solve for those guys and plug it back in the action, which formally means we integrate out these guys using the background field method in which this H is treated as a background. So we gauge fix the same way that I was doing everything, but with covariant derivatives in which you keep this H inside the covariant derivatives. That's the standard background field method. To construct your T mu nu, which is conserved, and it's now this guy. That couples linearly to the radiation field, which is your background. So you look at the linear piece, and that pseudo tensor now includes all the potentials. And this guy is conserved. This guy is indeed conserved. And now includes both the source and also the uh, part that is pure gravity. Source, like masses. OK? So this is how we incorporate all the self-gravity. We have to do the exact same thing that I just did, except that the leading order term, this will be the leading order term. Now we're going to have a quadruple that's going to have a T0, 0. And this T0, 0 we computed from the source, but also from all the self-gravity parts that are going to come from here. OK? And from the binary system, diagrammatically, what this means I have two sources, I have these potential guys, I have my radiation guys, I need to compute things like this. Okay? Where I integrate out my potential modes and they all dress this guy. We'll see this a little bit more in detail when I do the modern view. So I'm trying to <coughs> do the parallels of the way we basically rephrase many of these calculations in terms of uh, Feynman diagrams. Okay? <clears throat> exactly, exactly. Sorry? It is the finest size of the binary, yes. So now the binary became a point. In this, in this expression, this is the multiple moment of the whole binary system. So the whole binary system, or whatever, team, whatever distribution of matter you have in there, we map into something that only has, it's a zero plus one theory. It only has time dependence. And it's coupled to this radiation field. So 
So this expression will stay exactly the same, except that now the time dependence of this guy will include all the self-gravity. Okay? So now there are also high multiples, and you might ask, well, how are we gonna get those? And let me just, very, before I derive the, the quadruple formula, let me just make one quick comment, because this will help us to also uh, make a connection with the, the way we do things. Um, which rather, what we do things, in, rather than solving equations of motion, we, we go into the action. Because the action captures all the information that we need for the problem at hand, which is compute the radiated power and the binding energy of the system. Okay, so I wanna make a little connection with that, which you already see over here, because we are writing an action. Because this is the action that you vary with respect to H to get the equation of motion, right? And this gets stressed once you include all the self-gravity, okay? And if you're doing this at the level of the equation of motion, you get a bunch of guys here to the n power. Some of those we call potentials. We solve for them, we plug them back, and we get something linear in the radiation, okay? But instead of plugging back in the equations of motion, we do it at the level of the action by computing those diagrams. Because it's nothing but integrating now in the saddle point approximation the potential modes. This is the way we, we rephrase the calculation. But I want to uh, make one connection here, which will be uh, fairly straightforward, and, and to see how we reproduce these manipulations that I just told you at the level of the equations from the point of view of an action this is my action. So what I do, which is similar to how this Q came out, is do a multiple expansion of this field. So here is a T and an X. Because this is localized in the source, and this varies on much longer scales, we multiple expand this field H mu nu. So we take the H mu nu, and we multiple expand it around the center of mass that I'm gonna put at zero just for simplicity. And we're just doing this uh, uh, in space. Okay? This is a multiple expansion. And now we plug this into the action here. And then you see immediately what just happened the same thing that just happened at the level of the equations. If we look at the radiation field only, the first term is this, and therefore we get Tij, we get Tx, D3x, and we get Dt, H, T, zero. And this is the guy we just had a second ago. This is the guy we just had a second ago that we rewrote as a half d0 square t0 zero, zero, xi xj d3x. Great. Why this is great? Ij. This is great because now this action becomes localized. I integrate out the, the, the r scale. There is no more R here. It's only a theory that lives in a world line. It's only time dependent. So I match my whole thing into a point, and I produce the multiple that I was looking for with the full T mu nu that I also includes the potentials. So you get a half integral dt. There's two derivatives I can now integrate by parts, and I'm gonna hit this guy. If you include the other components, you will see that you're gonna build up the Riemann tensor, and it has to be because we do everything in a different variant way. So what we're going to get is a QIJ, which is this guy, and those two derivatives on the other guy, with a factor of a half, you're gonna build up the electric component of the Riemann tensor. In fact, you build the, the, the vial tensor, 
and we'll see why uh, the, the traces are not going to matter, why the traces don't matter, and also this means when, if this is the vial tensor, uh, this is symmetric trace free. And this is my action. Then the action match into this with a Wilson coefficient that is time dependent. So I map into a wall line theory, zero plus one. Okay? And now if I go from here and try to compute the one-point function, just compute the one-point function with a source, localized source, and I go to the TT gauge, I get this expression. Now from here, if I was uh, doing uh, uh, field theory, I could derive a power, an immediate power just from the uh, uh, graviton production. Or I can do the following trick, which is I do the optical theorem. I take the imaginary part of the self-energy. There's Q, I, J, Q, K, L. And here there is an E, I, J, E, K, L propagator. And I do the trick of using Feynman boundary conditions, which by the way, the optical theorem is not quantum, it's completely classical too. It could have been discovered after Maxwell, and, and I use the optical theorem. That relates the imaginary part when you integrate out the radiation field using the Feynman boundary conditions. The optical theorem tells you that this, which basically puts the guy on shell, is e equal to twice the emission power which is what you are after. So you can integrate out this guy, do this calculation, and then you'll see that you're gonna get many, many derivatives that are gonna land in Q. And then you're gonna get the quadruple formula. I will do this properly uh, later because we will see how this recovers all the orders. Okay, this is the filter way of doing the optical theorem or computing the amplitude of a graviton emission. That's the way we, we kind of slick way to find the total power. But the way it was originally done, or what people do, is from here, they go to the pointing vector and they just compute the power by integrating over the surface. But the answer obviously is the same. Why am I doing this? Because this is the way we start. I start here. I construct a theory which lives already here, which is a zero plus one theory. By this invariance, I can construct the form of these terms. It has to couple to this guy. And it's an object that I will call quadruple. I don't know where it is yet, but I can match this object by doing these manipulations backwards. And then I read what this QIJ is by looking at this and doing these manipulations. And therefore I learn that, ah, the QIJ of my zero plus one theory is this moment with the T zero zero that includes also all the self-gravity. I go to higher orders, how? Well, by keeping these guys, by now, looking at this guy and the higher multiples. And then you're gonna get here things like this. And this is a group theory. This is symmetric and then you have, a, okay, I'll do this, otherwise I get too distracted. So you'll see that you can decompose these guys in moments and then you start dressing up higher order corrections to this guy which go beyond this. Well, there is a two here, okay? So this is the way we're gonna do the calculation. Now, this is not the way that most people do the calculation, but for us, it seems very systematic to do it at the level of the action. So this is multiple moments at the level of the action, matching into a world and theory. And once you know who this Q is, either you do this trick or what I'm about to do to get the power. And once you know the power, and you know the binding energy, which I haven't told you yet how to compute, we can try to get the information about that picture. How much time I have? 20 minutes, oh shoot. Okay, so quickly. Uh, all right, so this is the pseudo tensor guy. Not for the, not the, for the short modes, for this guy. The pointing vector. Uh, okay, I was gonna do more derivation, blah, 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 blah. Okay, this is this guy then. For the TT gauge, it, Gets like this. This just follows, is this conserve uh, pseudo tensor lambda or, or if, if it has a million different names. Uh, that basically tells you that there is a, there's the conserve guy that tells you 
but this was a big discussion, right? People, whether this gravitation waves carry energy or not, and so on and so forth. Um, this was not resolved maybe until much later. Even Einstein did not believe in gravitational waves. He thought the full nonlinear equations of GR did not have, did not allow for gravitational wave solutions. He didn't believe in gravitational waves. He didn't believe in the expansion of the universe. Uh, he didn't believe in black holes. So you see, you can be a genius and still screw up. Um, so what happens here is that the T, the flux, will have the TCOI component, but because we are in retarded time, all the derivatives with respect to space and time essentially are the same. Where is my, uh, did I erase the H? I erased the H. Well, because the retarded time, the, the things are evaluated in T minus D, so it will take the or R, the X position. When, um, when you take that derivative with respect to X, it's the same as the derivative with respect to time. So this is essentially the same as the T0, 0. And that's why uh, I'm gonna use 0, 0. So the E dot that I'm gonna get uh, from the flux is gonna be, now the, the keeping track of everything is gonna pay out because this is the natural scale for luminosity. Um, and this is integral of this zero. I don't know where I'm pink now. Um, H i j t t t h i j t t, and the surface integral that we do at some distance t, and then this, and here I put the four pi of the thirty-two. Okay, so what I have to do now is just plug the expression that I had and I erased. For HIJ, ET, here, and sorry, here's TT, I had the projection. And this is a bunch of deltas and n's, so what's gonna happen is very simple. These t's are gonna cancel, this is gonna give me an extra derivative, so we're going to have something like us, like, uh, well, the c's and the g's, you see, the g's, there are these zeros here, so one of each is gonna give you c5, c5, so the, there's gonna be C10 downstairs and, and G's up, so you're gonna get a G over C to the five, so it's gonna be reversed. And we're gonna get QIJ triple dot, QIJ triple dot, symmetric trace free, symmetric trace free. And the coefficient will be a bunch of integrals of this guy that has the piece which has this guy. So there's gonna be integrals of moments of the unit vector on the sphere. And then you know, for example, Nifj over four pi, it's delta j over three, and, uh, and things like this. There's one over 15 with a bunch of deltas with the high ends. I'm not gonna do this, you get a five. But this E dot. And this is a quadruple formula. Now for us, this derivation will be, compute this guy, project this into symmetric trace free tensors, which will be the same as doing that integral, and then getting the imaginary part. The imaginary part will put those guys on shell and it will give you sort of like the phase space part. And that will give you extra the time derivatives because from here you get two only. So there's gonna be a D3K over K and that D3K over K gives you a K square that gives you an extra integral. I will do this calculation. And then you reproduce this. The, the nice thing about doing the calculation this way is that when I tell you here what comes next, by constructing this theory at the beginning, I will start from this theory 
and I can do this generically, I can get the generic formula, and then I do matching to tell you who these Qs here are by undoing what I just did this way. So instead of going this way, I'm gonna go this way. Okay? Uh, very good, so do I have more comments here? Blah, 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 blah. No, so, okay, good, we're done. Calculation now, we're gonna try to get this, this data. So now we're gonna do the binary, and we're gonna compute the radiation of a binary system to compute the E dot for the binding energy, which is gonna be crucial to get this evolution, we're gonna just use the Newtonian part. So this is like the Newtonian waveform approach. They said that Newton doesn't radiate. This is Einstein, but it's weak field, like linearized gravity. So it's linearized uh, radiation plus the, the Newtonian energy. The Newtonian energy we know we need because this is what is gonna complete the dots. Right, this is an expression for the radiation and who is E? Well, E is gonna be the binding energy, we're gonna take a dot, and then we're gonna see how the orbital frequency changes with time. And this is related to the frequency of the gravitational waves, which is what we observed there. Okay, so that's the, basically the idea. Now, this is, formally we're doing some kind of adiabatic expansion because we're saying that at each order, so the radiation is small, as you will see, and therefore we're treating as if we take a conserved quantity and we basically equate the conserved quantity over our orbit, so we integrate over periods to get an, like an average quantity and that change of that quantity in time is small and therefore we can go orbit by orbit adiabatically, right? If I were to, def to rederive instantaneously this equation by not doing this adiabatic trick, I would have to do something else, which we do to compute the radiation reaction force which, by the way, we'll see at which order this radiation reaction force will enter, but I'm not gonna do that here because of uh, time, obviously. But it's very interesting because it's related to the cell force problem, which is very important for LISA or for the stream mass ratio spiral, in which we cannot do this adiabatic expansion because the velocities are uh, large. Okay, so now very quickly, hopefully, hopefully I can get to this. Okay, so now, Y and X, we have, uh, did I do one and two? One, M1, central mass, X2, M2, and we have a frequency, this thing is moving, and this is just Kepler. So this is moving with some orbital frequency. Omega is given by Newtonian force, and this is R. So a few things that I'm gonna need. I need the mass ratio. Um, I'm gonna use the uh, symmetric mass ratio, which is nu over m. And m is the total m. This, this is useful because uh, in principle this is exchangeable is between one and two, which the post-Newtonian case, unlike the self-force case, is comparable masses we, we have invariance with respect to uh, one, two. Okay, so if I take the density now, it's very simple. There is no self-gravity at this point. So we just have a bunch of masses moving in space-time. This is our mass density. So we, have, we can compute the quadruple. We can take derivatives, so I'm gonna simplify uh, I'm gonna just jump into the answer. With two derivatives, which is what we need. This is two, you're gonna get a bunch of omegas. Mu r square, but well, it has to scale like mu r square, and the two derivatives are the omega square. And there is a matrix here that goes like this, cosine of two omega t, x, y, c plane, this is an x, y plane, so um, this is x, y, and c. Um, sine of two omega t, sine of two omega t, um, minus cosine of two omega t. <clears throat> the, 
this we will need for the, uh, for the amplitude. But if you want to get the power, you take an extra dot. By the way, here you see why the frequency is going to come out twice, the orbital frequency. Um, there's obviously the group theory argument or the spin to field argument, but it's also the actual calculation, uh, which often helps. Um, so now we compute the E dot, and this is the famous 32 over 5, G Newton over C to the 5. Nu square, omega 6, R4, M square. Do that as an exercise. And this can be rewritten at 32 over 5, nu square, that this ratio to the two-third, everything to the fifth, times the Planck luminosity I was telling you before. This, by the way, I don't know if you guys know, is about 10 to the 52 watts. So gravity is weak, so 1 over G Newton is huge. So the whole point is what is this, right? Because otherwise this would be a humongous luminosity. How you don't, it's humongous because the sun, if you compare with the sun, the sun is about 10 to the 24 watts, I think. And there are about stars, there are about 10 to the 26 visible stars in the universe. This, this, uh, as much as I remember, someone saying this. So you see this combined is still less than this. Right? And that's why people told you when you saw colloquiums about the LIGO detection that within fractions of a second, the amount of energy emitted was more, or the power is more than the, uh, the entire visible universe. Right? Why? Well, we have to see what the, this number is. Okay? Because this, for normal matter, as and our Earth sun is tiny. Who is this guy? Well, this guy is my X parameter that I had in my first uh, uh, lecture, which scales, as you can see, by using Kepler's law, scales like V squared. So this is V to the 10. So this effect here, for comparable masses, this is about a quarter. This is V over C to the 10. So depends how fast you're going with respect to the speed of light, um, you'll see how much you can radiate, okay? And we will do some estimate to try to fit some of the data here, you know, to know how, how big this coefficient is, okay? But the 10th power kills you unless you have a lot of uh, mass moving relativistically, okay? And getting very close because uh, uh, that's what will increase uh, the velocity, right? Okay, so from this guy, we're almost done. Now we need the E. Uh, so this is the, the E dot as a function of omega for a circular orbit. Now we need the E as a function of omega. This is trivial because I'm using the Newtonian approximation. This is simple um, X, which I can write. Uh, let me just write it. Uh, G. Do it this way, uh, G M omega over C Q to the two star. E of omega. So it's, it's just the binding energy, right? But I'm using that the uh, um, that the potential, the virial theorem, right? The potential kinetic chemistry are comparable. So you bind in energy, a living order is just this, right? In Newton, right? And I rewrite this as a function of omega, and I get this. And this is one half mb square. I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so now I take a derivative of this expression as a function of time. I get omega dot here, and I equate to the power, and I get an equation for omega dot how the frequency changes with time. So the expression that you get at the end of the day, so I'm trying to solve an equation for omega dot that's gonna be related to the frequency of the gravitational wave up to a factor of two. 
So how do I get this? Um, so essentially, you're talking d omega dt. So I can take e of omega and do d, d omega d omega dt. And this is e dot. So if I take this down here, I get d omega dt as this. And then you see this is flux. This is derivative with respect to omega of binding energy as a function of omega. So you see where this is going now. If I get higher corrections to the flux and the binding energy, I get higher order corrections to this expression, how much better I can fit the data, OK? This is the leading order uh, calculation. So from here, I get an expression that often is written this way for the rate of change of the orbital frequency that goes like this, times nu. And again, my beautiful parameter coming back to the five there. And this is b to the five. So it's a very small effect. So the, the, the shrinking of the orbit is a small effect, so they justify this adiabatic expansion. This adiabatic approximation in which I compute the binding energy as if it was conservative and I equate to the flux where I'm, I'm doing an integral over an orbit. Over an orbit, uh, there's a very small change in the energy. That's also the way you got the, the, the Hulse-Taylor pulsar, right? How the change in the period and the change in the orbit with time, circular orbit into circular orbit, even though that's not exactly what is happening, right? If you want to really track the motion, you have to do something else. And if you push me at the end of the lectures, I might tell you how to do that. Um, so now, this is the way I write things that make manifest the, the expansion pattern. So the ra radiation reaction force is a 2.5 pn effect, as you see from here, it's v to the five. So if you want to include the effects of the back reaction of the emission, this is a 2.5 pn effect where pn is a v c squared. And it's non-conservative. That's why it scares with fractional power. It's v to the five, right? It's not time reverse anymore. Um, OK, so here we're almost done now. Now it comes that famous chirp mass. The chirp mass comes because I rewrite this because you see there is a total m here. There's a nu here. So what people do very smartly is rewrite this in terms of something called the chirp mass. I cannot do that called the m, so I'm going to call it mc uh, in the board. Um, it's the same, but it's defined as nu to the 3 fifth times the total mass, which is that combination up there. And why this is important? Well, because that's the mass scale that enters in this equation, which is what I will get from the data. Because that tells me how to solve how the change of frequency in time for uh, the gravitational waves. And in however time I have, I will try to get the data. Tell me how much time I have. Five minutes, OK. Um, all right, I'll do this very quickly. And then next time, or during the discussion, uh, ask me again. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see how much, and then I want to explain. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So number one, the frequency, because the factor of two, is omega over pi for the orbital. This is the orbital motion. This is the frequency of the gravitational wave. I'm not going to keep gravitational wave there anymore. So I'm going to solve it. Then they will give me, this will give me an equation for f dot over f squared that I can integrate as a function of time, because there you see how it evolves with time. And therefore, I solve that equation. I'm going to skip a few steps. I'm going to give you the answer. So between frequency 1 and frequency 2, or time t1 and time t2, this is how the frequency evolves with time using the leading order waveform 
or, or w, uh, omega dot over s squared leading order, this is equal to a fifth g chirp phi sir c cubed times the time that goes between one and two. Which means I can solve for the uh, chirp mass if I know the time between two frequencies. So we can look at the data. So as we see here, the, the gravitational wave is seen in the lower in the lower panel, here at about 40 hertz, but zero is measured here, I don't know why, but okay. So around here, 40 hertz, you get like an amplitude of about 40, so it's more like 30 earlier, but here it's around 40. And then it goes very high, about 300, is the cutoff frequency around here. So because this is a high power of uh, uh, the frequency to a high power, as the frequency goes high, and let's say it's infinity here, we can drop this term between about 30 and what, 42, between maybe 35, say, and 43, like 0 0.008, say. So we drop this term, and we say this is about 40 hertz, and this is about 0.8 seconds. And now we put the Gs and the Cs and all that, and we get a chair mass, which is about, 30 solar masses. This is a very rough es estimate using the leading order. This is not how this is done, right? This is just uh, educational guess of leading order uh, matching of my, of my waveform. My prediction for the change in the frequency in time will give me, for this information, this chirp mass. Now remember the definition of the chirp mass, and this is m1, m2 over m1 plus m2 squared. If I parameterize as M1 like this, and M2 like one minus Y. Then this function is Y, one minus Y. It's kind of like this, a quarter. So it's always less than a quarter, which means that we can put a lower bound on M from the chip mass that tells us that the mass is a bigger or equal to uh, two M chip and this is about 70. We still don't know what the individual masses are, but we got the chirp mass extremely well from the measurement. This we can get extremely well, and we get even better. And we have a lower bound on the total mass. So how are we gonna get, well, and I haven't even said anything about this thing. How are we gonna get the M1 and M2? So we need to break the degeneracy. So this is done in different ways. But from the, from the analytic side, from the perturbative side, in which you can actually compute, this is done by including higher order corrections. If I go to this expression and I tell you what comes next, then it won't come out exactly as a function of M-chip anymore. It will depend on the X parameter, which is what count is B over C. So X is gonna come in as a function of M. It's gonna, if you factor out the M-chip, it's gonna have the mass ratio. And by measuring that, you're gonna get the mass ratio. Now, because it's done by V over C, the accuracy by which you're gonna get the masses is not as good as the accuracy by which you get the chip mass, but uh, that's life. But what we're gonna do is something kind of like uh, quick, and I'm wrapping now with this. Unfortunately, I had a few more things I can tell you. Maybe next time I'll do very quickly the other things because they're very nice. Because we can get how far the source was, how much energy is released, all from the leading order waveforms. Um, so the only thing I wanna tell you is, let's look at the cutoff frequency. So the cutoff frequency is around 300 hertz. So if we naively think that that happened when the two holes are on top of each other, so we can estimate what the typical cutoff frequency is by just Kepler. If we put here the Schwarzschild radius of the total mass, and if we do that, we get a mass that goes something like this. And we, do, we go from, from uh, orbital frequency to uh, actual frequency, CQ or G Newton. And then from here, using that the cutoff frequency is about 300 hertz, which you see over there, which by the way, really suggests that these guys are very compact, right? That you've got a very high, any other star which is bigger, it would have shut off much earlier with these masses, right? 
So this is really, really compact because it's co you get the more or less the right mass, which you could have inverted and say, how close did they get? And they get almost as close as the Schwarzschild radius with this kind of frequency. So clearly these objects are having 30 solar mass uh, 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 energy mass inside a sh almost a Schwarzschild radius. So this is a proof that things like really, really almost look like black holes are out there in nature with masses well above what we had seen before. So if we do that, then we get the total mass is about 70, which is com comparable with what we said I had lower mass. This is very naive. You get that M1 and M2. From this analysis, you get something like 40, 30, not quite, but similar, versus this was uh, 36 and 29. This is what was done numerically, the best fit. So it's not so bad. Uh, next time uh, I'll start, I'll give you how we get from the waveform amplitude, the luminosity, the instance, how far the thing was, which was around 400 megaparsec, how much energy was released, which was two, three solar masses, and uh, we'll see a little bit more about the amplitude and how we get things like this, which are how they look like in the, in the detector band. Okay? Thank you very much.